A sperm and an egg come together, and during fertilization, they become a zygote. And from that zygote, uh, eventually will come a baby, and from that baby will come you as an adult human being. And uh, you are bigger than that zygote, and you are bigger than that baby. But you're not just bigger, you are different. You're not just a giant zygote or a giant baby. Uh, things change. Anatomical and physiological structures uh, change, and we call that changing over time development. Um, so you are not just one uh, six-foot zygote cell. Uh, you are now trillions of cells uh, with all sorts of different structures that are different now than they were 10 years ago or 10 years before that. And we can divide development into prenatal, before birth, and postnatal, and we're going to talk about both of those here in a moment. Broadly, prenatal development is separated into embryonic development, which is essentially the first couple of months. And then after that, uh, starting the ninth week, um, you are a fetus. And so we call that portion of prenatal development fetal development. For those first eight weeks, from when you are a conceptus to when you are considered an embryo, and from uh, when you're an embryo until you become a fetus, um, you don't look very human at all. Um, essentially, you're putting together the rudiments of all of the body systems and structures that you're going to have. By the time you're a fetus, um, you look a little bit more human, you're recognizable, and all, the rudiments of all of those basic structures are there. Now, they're not functional, uh, but they're present, um, and they will develop over the course of fetal development into functional body systems that, that can take care of you once you're born. You can also divide this into three trimesters of gestation. And this is almost more from kind of the mother's perspective, but that first trimester includes all of embryonic development and the very first part of, of fetal development. So again, the first trimester is where you get the rudiments of all those major body systems. They're not functional, but they become present. In the second trimester, you're developing all those organs and organ systems. And by the end of the sixth month, when you finish with your second trimester, um, you look distinctly human, right? By the end of the second trimester, um, you're looking pretty baby-like. You're just small, uh, and many of your systems are, are functional. In the third trimester is when you're bringing those last body systems online, and you're getting bigger. You're gaining weight. Um, and to the point where in the last month or two, uh, if the baby is born prematurely, they have a pretty pretty good chance of survival as long as there's proper medical care available. Then you are born, and we start postnatal development, natal referring to the birth, right? So prenatal is before birth, postnatal is after birth, and postnatal development continues through maturity. Essentially, at the end of puberty, when you are sexually mature, you're an adult, you stop development. You don't stop changing, you don't stop aging, but, uh, but you've, you've kind of stopped developing. So in the first trimester, the beginnings of all the body systems appear. In the second trimester, they develop, uh, and many of them... Uh, become more or less uh, functional. In third trimester, those systems come fully online, uh, especially the ones that were not in second trimester, and the the fetus just gets bigger, and then you're born in postnatal development. So let's back up and talk a little bit more in detail about what happens from the beginning. So fertilization is the start of all of this, and this is when you have two haploid gametes a sperm and an egg. And to be haploid means you only have one set of chromosomes. So you have 23, whereas most of your body cells are diploid, which means they have two sets of chromosomes, or 46. And so two haploid gametes, and we talked about how those haploid gametes are produced last chapter, uh, will come together and form a diploid zygote. And usually this happens in the uterine tube um, between the ampulla and the isthmus, kind of a little bit further out in the... Um, in the uterine tube within a day or so after ovulation occurs. Something like 200 million sperm are deposited into the vagina at once. Only about 10,000 will find their way into the correct uterine tube, and less than 100 will reach the isthmus, and only a single sperm will fertilize the oocyte. Um, but you need a lot more for success, generally, because one does not have enough enzyme to break down the outer part of the corona radiata in the egg, you need more acrosomal enzymes from more sperm. So you can't just pop a single sperm on there. Um, so because of this, and, and you need this many sperm largely because it's it's dangerous, uh, 
you have a lot of sperm that are just going to die along the way or not make it. And so a sperm count that's below 20 million per milliliter is essentially sterility, right? Um, it's, it's very, very unlikely to, um, that you're going to be able to fertilize an egg with that kind of sperm count. So if you recall, the oocyte has not finished meiosis until fertilization. So it's stuck in metaphase two. So all of these uh, chromosomes are lined up uh, along the metaphase plate, and those chromatids are ready to be pulled apart, but they have not been yet, and they won't be until a sperm fertilizes the egg. And once that sperm fertilizes the egg, you know, we finish up meiosis here. You deposit the extra chromatids into this polar body, and the chromatids that are left will become the female pronucleus. Then you have a male pronucleus, and these will come together and fuse to form a single nucleus that will then immediately begin undergoing mitosis to divide. And this is an actual picture of, uh, of dozens of sperm trying to fertilize uh, one particular egg. So you get a pretty good, uh, pretty good feel for the size difference between sperm and eggs. So again, after fertilization, the male and the female pronucleus begin to come together. Even before that happens, the rest of the cell is preparing for mitosis. You're already forming a spindle. So they come together, uh, form a single nucleus, and then they lose the nuclear envelope, and you end up going through mitosis. So this is metaphase of mitosis. And this division that you then undergo uh, is the first cleavage. So um, you're essentially taking this cell and cleaving it, chopping it in two. So you end up from one cell getting two, as you do in mitosis, but these two cells are half the size of that one original cell, hence the idea of, of cleavage. And these two new cells are called blastomeres. And at this point, as that first zygote is being cleaved into smaller blastomeres during cleavage, this is not even considered an embryo yet. This is a pre-embryo, um, and it takes about a week uh, for that pre-embryo to travel the length of the uterine tube and eventually to implant itself in the endometrium of the uterus. After a few days of cleavage, you get a solid ball of cells of these blastomeres, and we call that a morula. Morula, uh, I think it comes from a root word for mulberry, and it kind of looks like a mulberry. Um, after a few more days, that solid ball of cells hollows out and becomes a hollow ball of cells called a blastocyst. Uh, and that hollow ball of cells obviously has a cavity inside, and that cavity is called a blastocele. C-O-E-L, seal, um, is a root word that means cavity. And here you can see that initial cleavage, right? Um, and then eventually we get to a morula and a late morula uh, in day four. And you can see this is where all these things are happening, right? We we ovulate you know, about two thirds of the way out uh, in the uterine tube, we have fertilization occur. And here is where all of these cleavages occur. And eventually here we get to an early and a late morula. And by this point, we are a blastocyst uh, when we implant in the uterus. Here we can zoom in on that blastocyst. So this is day six and day seven, and this is a cross section. So this and this look pretty similar, right? But this is not the cross section here. We've cut half of it off to see on the inside. And on the inside, you can see that you have this inner cell mass and then this big blastocele and these outer trophoblast cells. This inner cell mass is going to be what becomes the baby, right? Um, this outer cellular trophoblast is what is going to sort of join in with, with mother's um, endometrium um, to form this syncytium, this, this sort of open group of cells um, and, and that's going to take in mother's nutrition. Because because remember, in the endometrium, you've got lots and lots of good nutrients that you've been stocking that with for the last week or two. Then around day 12, these cells that you've been dividing and dividing into will begin to differentiate into different kinds of cells, right? So if you look at the very first cell, the zygote, obviously it can become any kind of cell in your body. It has to, right? As it divides, it has to have the instructions for every kind of cell in your body. But if you think about like a ball on the very top of a hill, it has the possibility of rolling literally in any direction. It could land in any place in the bottom of the hill. But as soon as it starts tipping, all of a sudden it can't land anywhere, right? So let's say it falls to the left, right? 
then it can land in lots of different places on the left side, depending on what bumps it hits along the way, but it's not going to land on the right side, right? That is That possibility is no longer there. Cell differentiation is very similar, right? As cells begin, they can become anything, right? Um, and then as they begin to differentiate and divide and divide and differentiate, they can become fewer and fewer things. So one of these first big differentiations is into different types of tissue. And there are three main types of germ tissue layers are ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Ectodermal cells can become essentially anything in your nervous system or your skin, right? Ecto, like outside, right? So your skin, and, and that's where your nervous system ultimately comes from. Endoderm are cells facing the inside of the yolk sac. That will become the gut. So, you know, your intestines and, and the you know, liver, pancreas, those kinds of, of tissues. And then the mesoderm is in the middle, and this will become blood, bone, muscle, uh, those kinds of things. And here you can see this happening, right? Um, the, um, the cell mass here becomes this plate, right? This, this flat plate of cells uh, that begins to divide, uh, and some of the cells start to dive into the middle. And ultimately, you end up getting uh, three layers of, of tissue, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm in the middle there. Around this time, you're also forming what are called extra embryonic membranes. Um, so these are things that are going to become membranes that support the growing uh, embryo and then subsequently the fetus. Uh, but are not necessarily part of the embryo or fetus. And these are sets of things that we share with birds and reptiles and other mammals uh, that essentially we evolved to be able to live outside the water, to be able to have an egg that, unlike a frog egg, say, uh, has the pond inside, right? It has everything you need. Uh, yolk sac, amnion, elantois, and chorion. Uh, yolk sac being there in most of those organisms for nutrition, not for us, it's a little different, um, amnion with that amniotic sac full of amniotic fluid that provides you some buoyancy and some support and cushioning as you're developing. Um, the elantois, which again, if you think of a chicken egg, um, is the place where waste is deposited. So as the embryo is, is developing, you're producing some waste, you have to get rid of it somewhere, you dump it into the elantois, and the chorion is, is uh, where they exchange gases. For us, the yolk sac is a place where we um, have some nutrition, but mostly we begin the production of blood cells and blood vessels. Um, amnion, same function essentially, right? Cushioning, supporting while we develop. Um, elantois and chorion are going to form, for the elantois, part of that stock, the umbilical cord, which makes sense because that's where we send our wastes. And the chorion is going to develop um, into the placenta which is also where we get our, um, our oxygen and drop off our CO2 for gas exchange. And here you can see on either end of that plate that will become the embryo, uh, you have the developing amnion and the developing yolk sac, which further develop here by two weeks. Uh, and you can also see uh, kind of the rest of, of this syncytium that's formed from the, the, the trophoblast, those outer cell layers that were or part of the blastocyst. And here you can see this a little bit more completed, the yolk sac, which again is going to be where our circulatory system begins essentially, blood cells and, and blood vessels. Um, you can see the elantois right here, which is going to be form that stock that will eventually be the, the base of the umbilical cord. Uh, the base of that elantois will ultimately become the bladder, which makes sense because that's where we deposit wastes. And the chorion is developing into this, right? It's got all these little bits of, of blood vessel, of capillary, that d jump up into mom's uh, area, um, which is full of her blood, and it allows for exchange between baby's capillaries that are part of this chorion, these chorionic villi, these fingers that stick up, and mom's blood. And that's the, the beginning of the placenta, which will essentially be that, right? Uh, all these places where baby's capillaries can allow for exchange between baby's blood and pools of mom's blood that she's sending to the placenta. And here you can see what in week five was an umbilical stock and the beginnings of a placenta have become the umbilical cord and an actual placenta by week 10. This is kind of a, a full and functioning placenta.